I've witnessed the ways in which community leaders have been talking about and planning for resiliency for many years. Often in times of challenge, though, those plans can be thrown aside. But I'm proud of the way our community has stepped up and leaned in as we've navigated the last seven months and how we've gone back to refer to our plans and adjust, pause, and nimbly mobilize resources to meet the changing needs and opportunities of our community. We've come together with the same spirit of collaboration that served our region well, while recognizing that as we move down the road to recovery, we must be committed to creating a better normal for all. We must be committed to creating a better normal for this entire region, where all are welcomed and integral to the conversations about how we move, move forward in a way that doesn't leave anyone behind. I look forward to today's speaker as he examines opportunities to guide us on our journey to resiliency. But before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to thank the sponsors who've made this conversation possible. APA Iowa, The Business Record, Capital Crossroads, the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines, Des Moines Area MPO, Greater Des Moines Partnership, and the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. As James Chung conducted his research, Greater Des Moines kept rising to the top as a region that was experiencing economic momentum. We were squarely on his radar before he ever stepped foot here. When he joined us two years ago, we learned a lot about some of the underlying metrics behind our success and why we might expect success in the future. That seems like forever ago, huh? <laughs> now as we look toward economic recovery, this seems like the right time to have James speak with us again. I think some of the themes of today will be familiar to us. Our ability to invest in major projects and our ability to work together as a region and as public, private, and nonprofit partners. And looking forward, our commitment to ensuring there are seats at the planning tables for all voices. Before I turn it over to James, I'll share a little bit about his bio and remind you, if something happens during this call and we get bumped off, just go back to the link and rejoin and we'll get started again. James Chung is the president of Reach Advisors, a strategy, research, and predictive analytics firm. Among his clients are U.S. cities wanting to peer deep into his data sets to help them gain competitive advantages over other cities. He extracts data even beyond what the U.S. government keeps. Please help me welcome James Chung as he offers us a look at what has worked well for us in the past and what can work for us to ensure a strong region after recovery. James, I'll turn it over to you. Christy, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, we, as Christy said, part of um, why we were so excited about getting asked to um, engage with Des Moines two years ago is as we were working with other cities, um, we often run a lot of quantitative uh, comp analysis, comparing cities to other cities like them. And we kept running into this issue. When we're working for other cities, we kept seeing and asking ourselves the question, why is Des Moines on top of a lot of the measures we're looking at? And so we had never um, really had a chance to, you know, we started dissecting that and noticed that there were some very interesting dynamics in Des Moines that do not happen to the same level in other cities. And so we were thrilled to be asked to come in and pick this apart. Um, and I will say that uh, there's one thing really clear about why Des Moines outperforms other comparable cities. And it's witnessed by this call this morning that there are 145 people on at 7.30 a.m. That shows uh, pretty heavy engagement in the city because that's, that's a big ask. So what we're gonna do is hopefully make this a worthwhile hour walking through what's happening in Des Moines, um, why did it outperform other cities, uh, and what does it look like in the future and what needs to get done to sustain that kind of growth. So with that, we're going to go ahead and walk into this presentation. And um, okay, here we go. When we came to Des Moines two years ago, we asked ourselves the question, um, one of the things we did is, you know, beyond the quantitative search, type in Google, why Des Moines? And we thought it was interesting because uh, we kept coming up with these articles like um, Des Moines, Iowa is actually cool. 
in the Huffington Post, or, you know, or you know, how the dullest city in America became cool in Politico. And uh, actually, some fantastic articles about that. So it's not just in the data, it's also what's getting picked up. And we're going to walk through this presentation, some of the highlights from that presentation, why Des Moines. One of the things that we noticed uh, from that presentation two years ago, we had been in the field doing micropolling across various cities on various measures. And one of them was just asking, you know, how confident are you in the future of your city? You know, would you stay in your city? You know, are you absolutely going to be staying in your city or you think about leaving? Um, questions like that. And here's what we came up with. Yeah, on that, um, actually, before we get there, you know, accolades left and right. And then we went to what the individuals were saying. So with the question of, when we asked the survey question, I'd absolutely stay where I am, Des Moines popped at the top of the comp cities versus I'd love to leave or I'm leaving now, Des Moines was lowest. I'm very optimistic about the future of the city, Des Moines was highest. Des Moines citizens are more favorable at their city than other cities. Um, and why are they more satisfied than comparable cities? Well, stronger economics goes a long way towards that. So when we walked through this presentation last time, we noticed that, uh, for example, Des Moines GDP is significantly higher than its comp cities. We're basically mid-sized central U.S. cities. Um, we noticed that the productivity, GDP per capita, is significantly higher than the comp cities. And on an individual level, average higher income, home value, uh, net worth. Um, no wonder people are happy there. Things are going pretty well. This was back in 2018. We updated the data and what we see is GDP growth is still at uh, twice the rate as comp cities. Uh, GDP per capita or productivity, 31% higher. So it's still staying strong. Um, we noticed that it's tapering off a little bit compared to when we were here in 2018. We'll talk about that. Um, let's unpack what's underneath all of this. Why is Des Moines operating the way that it is? And when we take a look at that, um, there's a very significant human capital advantage. And we're gonna pick this apart, take a look at a couple of measures. First on labor force and net migration growth. When we look at this figure, um, the part of the reason why there's an abundant labor market is that uh, when we take a look at net domestic migration, which is newcomers minus departures, back then we noticed that Des Moines had grown 32,000 people between 2010 and 2017 when we presented in 2018 um, versus the cities in red. Um, Milwaukee lost more than that amount of people. Uh, St. Louis lost more than that amount of people. Chicago lost way more. You know, Wichita lost about uh, half the amount of you know, what Des Moines drove in growth. It was the highest the comp cities. You have to go to like a Nashville or Austin to find higher growth than that. And of course, the update, we're seeing that net domestic migration continues to roll. You know, basically, Des Moines is about a top you know, 90th percentile city in the U.S., um, of the, in terms of uh, net migration. And net uh, migration tends to be one of the strongest predictors of many economic variables in our measurement. Um, so with this, um, we also find that uh, that means that the Des Moines labor force is growing, just like in the US, not in every city. For example, one of the comp cities, uh, labor force is dropping. But an increasing labor force means a couple things. Um, first off, we just did a calculation for a year uh, back when we presented um, that basically 2,000, again, 2,000 households in that one specific year is $110 million of aggregate uh, income that's in the market, which means you know, more homes, more cars, you know, uh, you know, many more things purchased and consumed in a stronger economy versus an almost identical comp city that lost households and lost aggregate income. Um, it just flows through really well. And what's the impact of a deep labor force? Well, a couple of things. One is it's easier for businesses to grow. It's easier to attract new businesses and it's easier to launch ventures. Now that has a little asterisk and we're going to be coming back to that. Okay. Now um, with the update, the Des Moines labor force continues to outpace U.S. growth. So things are looking pretty good. There's another human capital advantage we want to discuss as well, too. And that is we're going to bring back some of the last slides on the higher rate of educational attainment. 
Um, one of the slide sections we presented last time was that there are fundamentally more college educated workers in Des Moines. Um, this is compared to an almost identical comp city, identical same size, um, same part of the country. And basically, you know, basically equal numbers of it, households without high school degrees, of high school grads, of some college, but then in Des Moines, a significantly greater number of residents with bachelor's degrees or higher. And that is the exact same city in terms of demographics otherwise. Um, one of the reasons this matters is we found that each 1% increase in college educational attainment adds about $1,300 to a city median household income, but it's not just the college grads making more money. Um, everyone ends up making more money. So the more college grads there are, college grad incomes go up because there are others around them, but they go up even higher for the other levels of educational attainment. So a better educated city generates strong, stronger pay outcomes for everyone, which is a very positive thing. There's another human capital advantage that I wanna to touch on, and that is how Des Moines has been a mid-career talent magnet. So let's pull up some of the slides from the last time as a quick review. Uh, Basically, younger adult population grew four times faster than the rest of the US back when we looked at this. Age 30 to 44, significantly higher growth. Um, there was a disproportionate attraction of college-educated mid-career adults, as we had referred to in the last section, 34% um, growth, um, you know, significantly more than you know, two and a half times higher than the rest of the nation. So here's one thing I just ran. We have a data science firm that generates a lot of hyper local data. And I ran a heat map on this. And uh, it's basically the heat map shows location quotient by educational attainment and age. So blue is higher density than the rest of the US. Red is lower density than the rest of the US. As you can see, it is a better educated community. Um, and when we take a look at it, something really broke at around age 45. For some reason, it got dark blue, 1.5 times higher location quotient of those with associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees under the age of 45. And so one of the questions that uh, we've been sort of musing at around over here is, what made Des Moines so cool for the generation under age 45, where it became a migration magnet and brought in this kind of audience? Something good was really happening in Des Moines around that time. So um, beyond human capital, and we'll come back to some of the human capital issues in a bit, um, but beyond human capital, there's another kind of capital that has been driving outsized growth in Des Moines. And so let's take a look at that. Basically it's uh, capital investment, um, outsized capital investment. Um, in 2018, we mapped what were the various commercial developments, residential developments, and mega projects underway. And we don't exactly know which of these developments have happened, or they probably didn't, don't look necessarily like their initial architectural renderings. But when we looked at uh, Des Moines downtown civic development, you know, over that uh, period of the 2010s until we got there, there was five times more investment in downtown civic investment than comp cities. Uh, for downtown hotels, 10 times the civic investment versus comp cities underway. Um, at the time we we're noticing for downtown residential development, five times more um, commercial development underway. For uh, downtown commercial development, five times the level of investment in comparable cities. And in terms of mega power projects, five times the amount of capital investment versus comparable cities, cities of the same size. So that really, really added a lot of juice to the Des Moines economy. It's a community that likes to invest in itself. We do not see this in most central US markets and most mid-sized markets. Um, so that is a good chunk of also what was fueling the growth. But here's where we're gonna step back a little bit. Um, we also identified some challenges in 2018 that are becoming much more apparent as we look back in 2020 with updated and better data. And so we definitely want to spend a little bit of time looking at some of these issues. Challenge number one that we identified back in 2018 is young adult population growth slows as we look forward from 2018. And what we were noticing is the growth in young adult population 
uh, across the U.S. starts to slow in the mid uh, the mid decade. So basically, the audience where Des Moines has just been crushing it, um, growth rate drops by half, and with that, um, there is we could put on the table that there will be an increasing battle with the top markets for a smaller pool of top mid-career talent, the talent that had really fueled a lot of the growth. Um, now, let's do a little update on this. Um, the easy population growth of the past is now in the past. We ran this data specifically for Des Moines. And uh, maybe it's easier if I go live on this and um, this might help uh, make it a little bit easier to see. So let's take a look at the uh, population here by age. And as we take a look at this, um, what we can see is that uh, you know, each of these lines are the age groups 25 to 39. We've seen very strong growth over the last decade. So this is a lot of the growth that we had been seeing fueling this. But when you look at 2020 onwards, it flatlines. We have a different scenario coming up here where we're not going to get that kind of juice that fueled a lot of the growth of Des Moines. It flatlines. Now, compared to go slightly older, and we'll see a little bit of the difference here. When I add 40 to 44, um, we saw growth that decade and we see continued growth. But basically, it's the under 40s where we're going to see that growth taken away from us. And it's happening as of now. So we're going to speed up our projection at the time of the presentation. We had said that that growth is going to be dropping in the mid-decade. Um, we're accelerating that to say for Des Moines specifically, um, given the population dynamics currently in play, that growth stalls now. We don't have that engine in the same way before. And to get it, we have to be even more attractive for that kind of talent. And that has been part of the rocket fuel for economic growth, that that kind of growth had only happened in a handful of other unusually high growth cities in the past decade. So that's absolutely part of the equation that made it work. Um, so that battle with other top markets for smaller pool of top career, mid career talent intensifies, intensifies as of today. There's a second challenge we put on the table back in 2018, and that is Des Moines is a high beta economy. And what we mean by that is it has greater cyclicality than the rest of the U.S. In periods of the macroeconomic expansion, it expands faster. In periods of decline, it declines faster. And so that was one of the challenges we put on the table. And we talked about the concept of alphas and betas, which we calculate over at our data science firm, it borrowing from financial portfolio theory tools off Wall Street. We do this for local market analyses too. Um, if you are a stock trader, you probably are comfortable with the concept of alpha beta. If you're not an aggressive trader, uh, maybe less so. So let me step back and try to talk through this a little bit. Um, it's basically how Wall Street, uh, one of the measures Wall Street uses to assess um, you know, stock performance and stock future performance is taking a look at alpha and beta. We map it to local market economies. And alpha um, represents a region's level of economic overperformance on a cyclically adjusted and risk adjusted basis compared to what the average region would typically deliver. So one way to think about it is stronger regions have higher alpha, weaker regions have negative alpha. Beta represents a region's level of cyclical sensitivity to overall US macroeconomic trends. Once again, uh, faster growth during recovery periods in the macroeconomic cycle, deeper declines during recessions. Highly cyclical regions have high beta, less cyclical regions have low beta. And so let's take a look at Des Moines. And since this is a little bit small, I'll also go back to, um, let's take a look at it live. Um, and here we go. Hopefully this is gonna come across a little bit bigger and I'm gonna point out a couple things. So alpha is 0.03% with national average is zero. So it's slight alpha. Beta 1.27, national average is one, so it's, Basically, so alpha means that Des Moines will grow about 0.3% more GDP than the rest of the US, whether we're in a recession or an expansion period. Beta means that basically it's gonna grow about 27% or it's gonna be 27% more cyclical than the rest of the US, um, whether in an expansion period or in a recession. 
Uh, so that means things like um, when we take a look at the growth over the last uh, five years, that's when we can see things like um, basically population grew at a much faster rate than the comp, which is the U.S. Um, households grew at about, you know, so basically population grew at about uh, close to two and a half times the rate as the rest of the U.S. in the last five years. Household growth was about double that of the U.S. over the last five years. Um, now, this is also one thing that sort of puzzled us, and that is uh, employment um, was interesting to us because it over the last five years, since five years ago, it's up point or 2.7 percent when the rest of the U.S. is down 2.9 percent over five years ago. Uh, because in a high beta economy, you would usually see even greater employment loss, but it didn't happen this recession. Um, we'll pick into that a little bit because I think that little discrepancy um, helped us understand more about what's really driving the Des Moines economy. Now, um, the challenge we have is that with relatively modest alpha, um, assuming that we have a fairly flat economy, not a high growth economy, basically the growth rate is going to be slowing on an organic basis. Growth rate is going to be slowing a little bit as we move forward. So that is just some of the things that I want us to be considering. Um, once again, maybe a little bit technical background, but um, we'll try to bring that, tie that with some other points we're about to show in the presentation. Um, when we look at alpha and beta, there are a couple other things that we want to take a look at as well, too. Um, as we mentioned here, um, Des Moines is a low alpha uh, community. Basically, the growth is beta-driven growth. And we're going to take a look at uh, a couple questions here. I'm going to go take a look at this one here and uh, just take a look at, um, let's take a look at, this is a map, map, mapping alpha. Um, and what we find here is Des Moines. It's really interesting. When we look at the uh, communities around Des Moines, um, Des Moines itself is actually slightly negative alpha, or I'm sorry, Polk County. Um, basically, Polk County is going to lag on average until you factor in beta. Um, but once you remove cyclicality, it's going to lag the rest of the U.S. by about 0.2% uh, on, uh, on GDP. Um, but the Des Moines uh, metropolitan fiscal area actually is positive alpha. A lot of that is driven by Dallas County, which has off the charts alpha, 6.7% alpha. That looks like, for example, Williamson County, just north of Austin, Texas, in terms of alpha. Um, it means that basically on a cyclically adjusted basis, it is going to overperform, whether in a recession or out of a recession. It's such a deep discrepancy that um, we looked into it, and I think we realized why. I'm assuming there's a lot of new commercial development in Dallas County going on right now, and a lot of new um, uh, civic infrastructure investment going on in Dallas County right now. Um, and uh, that is basically, that level is like the level um, just outside of Austin. It's like the level of alpha just outside of Salt Lake City. Some extremely uh, parts of uh, Nashville, extremely high overperformance. Um, and the question is, can more of the Des Moines region have that kind of alpha? Our real estate clients who use this uh, kind of data are basically looking for what they call hidden alpha. They're trying to figure out where is their alpha that others don't see because that's where they want to deploy capital because it's simply going to grow faster than other places. Um, and so the question is, and you'll see that we're going to raise is, how can we inject more alpha because, um, you know, that, and bring up the entire region. Now, there's another thing I'm going to show when we flip over to beta. Um, and once again, we'll try to use maybe less quantitative examples, but talk about why this is important in a little bit. Um, Des Moines and Dallas County have high beta. In other words, um, high levels of cyclicality, which we were scratching our heads over that because it did not end up getting hammered as bad as some other counties in this recession, when high beta typically implies that it will. Um, now, fortunately, this was not a re recession led by the industries that dominate the Des Moines economy. Yeah, it wasn't a mortgage-driven recession. It wasn't a 
um, real estate driven recession um, that help, you know, versus a tourism driven recession um, or travel driven recession in a lot of ways. So the counties came out better, but we'll talk about actually the benefit of high beta in just a little bit. So when we go back to the presentation slides now, um, let's go to, you know, questions. We'll revisit what's driving such high elf in Dallas County and what more can happen across Des Moines, uh, the Des Moines region. Um, why high beta can actually be a very positive thing for Des Moines. Um, but back in 2018, um, this is what we had seen at the time. Um, high beta basically means um, strong rebounds coming out of recessions. We saw it in the early 2000s. We saw it in the early 2010s after the last two recessions. Much stronger recoveries than the rest of the U.S. That's part of why high beta can be a very positive thing. We also saw a steeper decline in the prior recession. And what we had mentioned at the past, one of the biggest risks that Des Moines has is regression to the mean. Um, and so we were mapping out that basically, can it sustain that level of outpacing? And when we just updated the data with two more uh, year data, we did find that that is exactly what was happening. Um, since the last time we were there, Des Moines has indeed been regressing back towards the mean. Now, we did include 2010 because things got so wacky then, but you know, Des Moines got hit like all the rest of the U.S., not quite as hard, but definitely moving back towards the mean because so much of the growth happened during this period of time in the early mid-2000s when there was a ton of capital investment being poured in the market that was in planning earlier in the cycle. Um, regression towards the mean is not bad. Des Moines is still the healthiest among the comp set cities. But a um, couple of takeaways as we realize what's been happening, um, one of our big realizations is Des Moines' unusual growth for the most part has been beta-driven versus alpha-driven. In other words, it's not because of structural outperformance um, like in higher growth cities. It basically works through economic recoveries stronger than other cities, which is a healthy thing. Um, Des Moines' high beta is to to it's not so much because it is a boom and bust city, like most high beta cities, and a lot of them are in the Midwest, actually. Uh, but Des Moines high beta is more due to extremely strong overperformance during expansion cycles. And this vast outperformance is driven by unusually large investments for a mid-sized city early in recovery cycles that pays off in spades enabling unusual levels of sustained growth that simply is not seen in most other mid-sized cities. The reason why we think it's really important to flag this is Des Moines has now proven that it gets more, it drives more economic growth than almost any other city of its kind uh, because it invests in itself coming out of recessions. Um, and that drives significantly stronger growth during those periods of time, because for some reason, Des Moines is very, very sensitive to economic cycles in the sense that when it vests early in a recovery, it delivers boffo economic performance. Um, so the bottom line uh, when we look at this is, question we put on the table is, can Des Moines turn on another wave of productive major investment coming out of this recession? And um, if so, the Des Moines economy will continue to grow faster than comp cities and the US in the 2020s. Um, if Des Moines pulls back on investment, it'll probably go grow um, maybe a little bit faster because it, it has some beta. But um, if it continues that kind of capital investment, if it continues to invest in itself, if it continues to believe in itself, it grows faster than the comp cities. Now, the bottom line on alpha is, except in Dallas County, growth is beta driven versus alpha driven. Um, in other words, it's because it rides cycles better than other cities. It's not because of structural overperformance, um, except in Dallas County, but that's what I'd like to see happen across more of Des Moines. Um, so the question we put on the table is, can Des Moines unleash hidden alpha? It's fundamentally what a lot of our clients are doing is trying to understand whether large scale real estate investment or whether um, economic development, trying to figure out 
how to ride the economic cycles, how its industry structure rides economic cycles, how to leverage that, and how to look for unleash and untap hidden alpha. Now, that's harder said than done. So that's going to be part of the challenge that we're going to turn this next section of the presentation on is uh, where and how can we find hidden alpha in the market to drive stronger risk-adjusted, cyclically-adjusted performance growth. Um, coming out of this recession, if Des Moines out-invests other cities effectively, the winning streak absolutely extends. It just has this track record and capability of doing that. So um, continue to out-invest, um, and it'll be strong beta-driven recovery coming uh, for the, you know, through this next, uh, when we go through this recovery cycle. Now, here's the challenge on the table. If Des Moines out-invests other cities effectively and manages to unleash alpha, that's a formula that is rarely, rarely found that can drive strong beta-driven growth and strong alpha growth. What happens is if you unleash alpha plus keep driving those beta-driven investment gains in the city, you end up with the fastest growing mid-sized city in the U.S. This is fundamentally the formula for the Salt Lake City region, Nashville, Austin, Raleigh-Durham is being able to put these two things together. Um, alpha has been the historical weak spot, and that's what we want to look at now. So back in 2018, we laid out a third challenge we noticed about disruptive innovation or how to put more alpha into the economy. And the um, question is, can Des Moines rely on what's worked on the past or can it reinvent as the economy evolves? One of the things we noticed is it's a city where a third of the economic output is driven by the finance, insurance, real estate, the fire industries. Um, and one of the questions we put on the table is what happens when AI replaces jobs like accountants, actuaries, agents, claims adjusters, customer service reps, examiners, uh, financial managers, loss control specialists, you know, marketing managers, salespeople, underwriters. Um, it's a huge question mark because these are the jobs of Des Moines. Now, this isn't a theoretical question. This is a personal issue to me. Um, I run this really fun company that does extreme analyses in highly in different, differing situations. I thought that my job would be the last ever to get automated uh, because it is non-routine, highly analytical. It's got to combine a lot of data, um, weave a lot of things together until I realized that's exactly what machine learning does. Five years ago, I woke up one morning and realized my job is to gonna be toast. Five years ago, I realized in 10 years, I'm either not gonna have a job or I'm gonna be working a lot harder for less money because machine learning is going to take a big chunk out of my work and commoditize my work. Um, that realization five years ago is exactly why I launched the data science firm that generates hyperlocal economic and dem demographic forecasting analysis. Um, because we decided, well, if our job is going to be put out, we're going to be put out of jobs because of machine learning. Let's go build the machines to do that. That's the question I pose for Des Moines is, can it come to that same realization? Because there just simply isn't going to be the same level of hiring of those kinds of jobs in the future. So that is sort of disruptive innovation that we want to think about. It's either going to, you know, either growth will decrease or there's a complete reinvention in alpha that's going to be driven in the economy. Now, let's step back and talk about the digital and algorithmic reality. One of the things we pointed out back in 2018 were a couple of examples. I brought this example of what Progressive introduced uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, where you plug in this device into your car and they are able to underwrite your car insurance based on your driving patterns. Every major auto insurer started rolling out the same thing um, until someone realized you don't need to plug stuff in your car. Everyone cares, carries a car phone and finally cracked the nut on how to create a viable economic model around that to deliver cheaper rates for the customers they choose to insure and generate a lot more profit because it can be do, done, the business can be delivered with a lot fewer people. Another example of industry transformation that we put on the table back in 2018 was um, in the actuarial world, they're constantly measuring variable importance on factors. And this is one, a chart on uh, variable importance for uh, mortality. 
uh, for underwriting life insurance. And obviously, the number one factor driving um, mortality rates is age. The next one is gender. You know, women live longer than men. And then there are factors like drug use, uh, body mass index, blood pressure, various health factors that help insurers score mortality risk so they can underwrite life insurance. Now, if you notice, there's a little bit of a gap between the first green bar age and the next one gender. And the reason why there's a gap is because there was something else that people have found since then that's the second most important factor, but we didn't know it. And the reason why we didn't know it is that we had not had the data before until these things. And actually from this 2018 presentation, that watch looks pretty quaint now, but what's happening is that opened up a new set of data that found that the second highest variable in importance is number of steps you take per day, predicts mortality, much higher than gender or a score of other health factors. And so that led one insurer to basically declare, John Hancock no longer underwrites life insurance unless you wear a device that monitors your activity. Um, and so um, we're gonna see more innovation like that, um, whether or not they succeed with that. Like for example, in the prior example of auto insurance, some first wave things were sort of testing the market, then someone really cracked the code. But um, those are the kinds of things where the world of data, the world of analytics, the world of computational power changes everything and changes the economics of everything. Now, once again, looking at Des Moines, um, there's an extreme dominance in the um, insurance of the insurance and finance sectors in Des Moines. It's 20% of the job, 21% jobs. It's a third of the GDP. Um, it's a third of private sector wages. Um, and when we look at the dominance, this is great. These are great jobs. Um, you know, with 21% of jobs, but 34% of private sector wages. And, you know, they're jobs that pay pretty well. Now let's look at the flip side of the dominance of the insurance and finance sectors. And that is employment and wage growth in those sectors is growing at half the rate of other sectors nationally and in Des Moines. So um, key questions for Des Moines growth, how do we continue to grow core assets and how do we leverage that platform to diversify? So let's jump into another topic here. Um, and that is another key question for Des Moines growth is one of the most concerning things that uh, my colleague Sally found when she updated this for 2020 is in Des Moines, the rate of new business formation is half the US average. Despite the fact that we have such strong population growth and economic growth, new business formation rate is half, which is odd because in almost every city across America, um, new business formation, net new business formation is almost straight line correlation with population growth. You know, every 17 to 27 people that, you know, of, of uh, net new population growth spawns a new business almost everywhere across the U.S., except in Des Moines. Well, there are a couple exceptions, but um, new business formation is half the rate. So in other words, it's a fantastic place if you're working for one of the large employers of Des Moines. Great employers, great jobs, um, but there's something that is not clicking in terms of new business formation. Whether we're talking ventures, whether we're talking about small businesses, um, the engine is just not the same in Des Moines. And so it's one of the things that I do want Des Moines thinking about to be able to create new job opportunities, new wealth creation opportunities across a span of industries, type of work, um, types of businesses. It's definitely a gap. Now, we're going to go back to taking a look at uh, the kinds of things that drive alpha. You know, there, there are two types of businesses out there um, that uh, in one type of classification we use. They're the uh, you know, traded cluster businesses and the local businesses. Traded cluster businesses are the ones that basically they can locate anywhere they want. Um, they supply a market much bigger than the local market. They tend to concentrate in certain areas where there's some kind of critical advantage um, and they pay higher wages and have higher wage growth. And then there are local cluster businesses, which we also want to pay attention to. And that is the businesses that serve the local market. They tend to be 
present everywhere, um, and they grow with population size. Um, both are not growing at the same rate. Now, let's take a look at the, uh, you know, that, that traded cluster, the high alpha businesses. Um, you know, startup ratios, you know, ventures, it's on par with slow growth central U.S. cities, um, like Detroit, like Cleveland, like Cincinnati. Um, but the startup ratio is well behind Midwestern cities like Nashville, Madison, Columbus, and others. So let's take a look deeper into this as we peel back. Um, we have this amazing stability that puts us at risk of stagnation. Um, Des Moines drives growth and stability in large part due to the strength and dominance of the insurance and credit industries. But that same, same stability is creating a challenge as job growth in those industries has flattened. Um, let me lay out one example of industry transformation as to why this matters. And um, I'm going to walk through the case the you know, history of a Duke undergraduate. Now, there are some people on this call when they see this photo, they already know what the punchline of this one is going to be. But um, let's just walk through this example. Um, here's a student who uh, studied at Drake, um, actuarial sciences, uh, as an undergrad. Um, he takes a job in an insurance company, works there for four years, um, comes up with an idea, and he raises $3 million from a local investor. Um, that enabled him in the next year to hire Duke grad as chief actuary for the firm, and he launched the first insurance product. Um, now, there was some interesting news that came out about that company uh, just last week, and that is um, they hired Goldman Sachs to file for an IPO valued at five to six billion dollars. To put that in context, um, Root Insurance is worth half the amount of the principle that's been around for more than 100 years, despite that Root Insurance has only been around in operation for, seven, for, for, for three years. The punchline for this uh, photo, of course, is that skyline in the background is not Des Moines. The skyline is Columbus. Um, it's the exam it was the example of the cell phone um, usage-based auto insurance that basically, as they got their models down, you know, basically, if someone wants to get insured, you drive with your phone for three weeks, and then they will be able to tell you whether they're going to insure you for not. And if they like you, they're going to give you a cheaper rate. If they don't like your driving patterns, they don't insure you. And they do it with about one-tenth the level of staff as other insurance companies. Um, and uh, they have better, they, you know, have better underwriting risk. Um, they have better margins. Uh, they're using that same kind of analytical process to enter rental and housing markets. Um, but this is a company that's basically built off Des Moines talent. Um, so this is the kind of example of industry transformations I want us to be looking for. And fortunately, there are two insurance industry incubators in Des Moines. And uh, we'll talk more about uh, you know, ways we can think about driving more juice out of that. Part of the reason why Columbus has done so well is, um, I don't know, they've got some really good things going for them. Uh, they have twice the number of insurance and fintech startups versus Des Moines, despite the fact, now Columbus is a bigger city, but they have the almost exact same levels of companies and employment in those sectors. Um, so despite having the same size of those base industries, they generate twice the number of startups. Part of the reason is they generate more than 10 times the amount of funding for those startups. And that's after removing the $500 million that Root Insurance has raised. Um, so uh, they get a lot more money flowing in these ventures. And why is that? Uh, when we took a look at it, um, they drive more early stage funding because their most successful entrepreneurs returned home. They left Columbus, they made a lot of money, and they came home. And they are deploying that money like mad. Um, that's one of the differences there. Now, um, it's not just for ventures. There's also industry transformation for the large companies. And there's something that they realized. The large companies acknowledged that the, simply, that the city simply could not be competitive. It didn't have the size and scale or the location to recruit the most sought after talent um, in the toughest technological areas of technological advancements. So what the large companies do, they all put 4 million bucks each um, and got about the same money from the state to create a cooperative 
company called Covale, uh, which basically makes a basically builds a cooperative staff in very hard functions like AI, machine learning, uh, advanced uh, cyber security, advanced automation, that basically clusters extreme talent that did not exist in the market um, and makes it available for both the sponsoring companies and now the non-sponsoring companies. So they have access to that kind of talent. Um, and uh, you know, basically what they're doing also is they're bringing in people who basically went to Ohio State, left the market, built amazing talent, and they bring them back. And then they deploy that talent across Columbus companies. That's an example of part of what's driving that juice. I'll throw another example of another city. Um, we just ran an analysis for another client. And then we were looking at Salt Lake City specifically because that's another high growth market. And what happened was there was an entrepreneur there who launched the company around 2000 and had really struggled to raise money. Um, in 2007, he realized he's always find other cities to raise money. They don't come to him in Salt Lake or any of the ventures there. So they created the Silicon Slopes concept. Um, and basically for the, two, for the 2000s, for most of the 2000s, you know, they raised you know, oh, eight figures of venture capital a year. Um, but they created that concept. Um, and then two years later, three years later, he sold his company, two companies sold. So there was a lot of money to unleash in the market. Um, there was also a, up, you know, basically a significant federal driver with Utah Data Center. Um, they really uh, took Silicon Slopes, put on steroids. Um, and what happened was Salt Lake City, which is twice the size of the Moines, so it is larger, but they have 100 to 140 venture deals a year. They're bringing in $800 million of venture capital a year. Totally dwarfs what's happening in Des Moines, um, despite the fact they're only twice as large. Uh, they really dialed in well. And what's the outcome of that? Basically, in the last two years, five unicorns were companies worth over a billion dollars. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, you know, his company sold and just a lot of seeds dropped from the tree. Now, what are some of the lessons um, from Columbus and Salt Lake City as we're looking at this? One is they both acknowledge that they can't. It's almost impossible for non-coastal mid-sized cities to build critical mass in the super high growth areas without, you know, organically, it's never gonna happen. They knew they had to do something to add extra juice to that. Other observations, they aggressively target successful alumni to return. Um, like that Covale example from Columbus, you know, pretty much everyone went to Ohio State. Um, you know, they, um, they weren't gonna attract someone who had never been to Columbus, but there, but there are a lot of people who've been through Columbus who liked the place and, want, and would be willing to come back. Salt Lake City, same thing. Um, now, the other, another thing is they sell mid-career professionals. Once again, the, the audience that is rocket fuel for high growth companies, but also the audience that is now where the growth is peeling back, they sell true availability to remain at the cutting edge of the work because of these things happening. And they get a better place to live and raise a family. Another observation, Extreme clustering. They don't try to do this for everything, but they pick their bets. The Silicon Slopes is about technology. Um, Columbus is about technology. And they do extreme clustering that reduces redeployment risk. In other words, why would someone move to a secondary market if there's only one company like out there? And what do you do if the company goes out of business like Ventures do or if you lose your job? But if there's clustering, you don't worry about that because there's always the next company you can move on to. And another observation is extreme collaboration among leading businesses, not just for that co-op, that, co that uh, cooperative uh, Covail, but also like an example we picked up in Salt Lake City is, you know, when they're recruiting someone from out of the city to come in, the company just doesn't meet with them. They have them meet with other ventures, mainly because it's a way for them to sell. Yeah, come from Silicon Valley. There are many companies like us out there. We want you to work at our company, but you should know if it doesn't work out, there are a lot of other companies that want you. And they collaborate with recruiting talent that way. It's pretty amazing what they're doing, but they're getting fantastic outcomes from it. Those are markets like Salt Lake City and the Provo area is driving basically the kind of alpha that we're seeing in Dallas County, but it's across the entire community. 
they're doing a pretty good job with that. One other thing we'll put on the table is, besides the future of insurance credit sectors, one of the things that has puzzled us is, why does San Francisco, Boston, and Austin, and Denver have more ag tech companies than Des Moines? I mean, Des Moines has the world's leading ag school. It's a second leading ag producing state, 16 leading ag and bioscience companies. You got the legacy of, Mor of Norman Borlaug, all the reasons in the world where ag tech should be centered in Des Moines. And of course, there are good efforts around that. There's a great incubator in place, but the constraining factor goes back to um, critical mass of tech resources and venture talent. It's why it's in San Francisco, Boston, Austin, and Denver. Um, they can acquire the ag tech talent. They can move them there. Um, but that critical mass tech resources and venture talent is what's keeping that from happening in Des Moines, which is why all this matters because then we can tie, it's that missing leg of the stool that can tie all these things together for all of the core industries of Des Moines. Um, so just to sort of wrapping things up a little bit to you know, provide examples, one more thought to plant is, there's a concept of power laws where basically things don't operate linearly. In other words, growth isn't linear in the tech world. Basically, the, you know, the leaders are dominant. The number two is usually distant. Number three is further distant. Um, yeah, number four is probably not even in the picture. When power laws make it nearly impossible to critical mass of tech resources and venture talent, what can be done if you're not one of those coastal tech powerhouses? Um, what are the things that can create the Austins, Nashvilles, Raleigh, Durhams? What are those breakthroughs? I'm going to provide three examples from some clients we work with. Beyond these presentations that we do, there are some clients that we work with where we get really hands-on, trying to assess, really, really pick apart the assets, the problems, and finding these levers to be able to navigate and drive you know, inorganic growth, to drive alpha. And uh, I'll throw three quick examples out here. That is, uh, one is a, uh, an extremely similar city, exact same population, exact same geographic challenges um, with very similar challenges of no alpha. Um, well, they fortunately got you know, Deloitte to commit to building the uh, Manufacturing 4.0 Smart Factory Research Center there. Um, they now have government, um, uh, the, 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 you know, the US government is expanding their AI research centers and what they're doing now is beyond just the academic benefit of that, they're now working on plans to launch educational training on AI in the workplace free for every interested resident. Um, basically, just admitting we are toast if we don't understand the AI world. And it's not an AI kind of city. They recognize their toast. So they're going to make that, avail that kind of AI training free for everyone there. So an example of how that can pay off is um, when Tesla went looking for their next major factory for the Gigatruck uh, this year, um, they had it down to two cities. They said they wanted central US and they had it down to two cities, um, Tulsa and Austin. Tesla usually likes the Tulsas of the world. Their other plants are in like Reno, Nevada and Buffalo, New York. Um, they like the Tulsa kinds of cities. They really like Tulsa a lot. But in the end, they went with Austin. Austin did not pay more to buy the Tesla gear truck factory. Um, it was simply because they had more talent that could drive the, that could basically manage an AI factory. But a city that can do this, where a large portion of the workforce now starts to understand how AI impacts the workplace, that city would have won the Tesla gear truck factory. So that's why that city is in a race to pull this off. Another example, one of our clients is the nation's largest master plan community, or one of them, and they're building their next town. And what they're doing is they're going to market with the ultimate remote work community, specifically targeting employees from Bay Area and LA tech companies to move to their community and work remotely from there. And so once again, they're going to be clustering that kind of workforce in their next town. And the third example I'm going to put out there is you know, we just are in the midst of a pro uh, project with a county with hugely valuable assets in place, but low alpha and low rate of new business formation. It's one of those other exceptions like Des Moines that just doesn't grow new businesses. Um, they're now working on plans to cluster the assets for the quantum computing future. 
which is the next paradigm. And basically, they're out to create the next Silicon Valley of the 2030s. And they're going to do this community-wide, um, training for the community, uh, basically putting all the assets in place to dominate the quantum computing world. So I raise those examples with this final question of, can Des Moines get even bolder to untap hidden alpha and craft the strongest and fastest growing and healthiest mid-sized city in the US? Like we said, we know Des Moines can ride beta-driven growth well, just invest heavy at, you know, at starter recoveries. In other words, you know, Des Moines we know is a city that believes in itself. It can invest early and it can end up driving greater gains than other cities would. We know it can do that. Alpha is harder. New business formation is harder. Um, can it craft those pieces to build the strongest and the healthiest mid-sized city in the U.S.? And to answer this question uh, as a final thought, um, when I was last in Des Moines, and I so regret I have to do this during the era of pandemic because I would have loved to have been in there in person to get even a better sense of what drives Des Moines, what makes it tick. But last time I was there, someone was kind enough to give me a little, uh, leave me a little uh, gift bag, um, including a couple things. And I guess that gift bag answers this question best as whether Des Moines can get even bolder to untap hidden alpha and craft the strongest and fastest growing mid-sized city in the U.S. And the answer is, there we go. Um, thank you, Ray Gunn. Thank you for that. And thank you for that gift. Um, but with that, I am going to open up for questions or comments as we think about where Des Moines is now, what got us there, and what it can do moving forward. So I think, Todd, you're going to uh, take things here for a second, right? Yeah. Uh, thanks, James, for your comments. Appreciate it. And learning more about how uh, the region can uh, reinvest in, in itself and in the, potentially in the tech, egg tech industries and quality of life and just develop uh, huge returns back to the region. I uh, want to thank our sponsors again for making today possible. Um, these are the kinds of insights and inspirations uh, that we try to deliver through the speaker series. I think the best thing about the speaker series are the conversations that get started with them and then uh, continue on afterwards and the ideas that spring from those. Uh, James, as, as mentioned, has agreed to stay on for question and answers until about nine, nine o'clock. Uh, so we'll turn it over to Chris Konetsky, publisher of the Des Moines Business Record, to moderate that discussion. Chris? Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. And, and James, uh, thanks again for another great presentation. I was looking through uh, the articles from last time, and I think I've mentioned your presentation uh, from podiums and our different events multiple times over the, the course of the last few years. So thank you again for the, the new data. Um, so we, uh, for folks here on, on the line, feel free to go ahead and throw some, some questions into the chat. There's already been some great ones that I'll try to get to. Um, while you think about some questions to, to throw into the, into the mix, uh, James, I wonder if you could take a look. Um, you talked about that timeline accelerating on that population under 40 uh, kind of tapering off. Yeah. What, what type of things do you think are leading to that? Um, maybe the acceleration of that timeline. And I, I remember one thing you mentioned last time was that the population for the United States in general um, there's not as many people in that in that target area that we've done so well in to begin with. So I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, there are two factors driving the acceleration of uh, basically that engine, uh, the growth under that engine is gonna be slowing. And we're moving that prediction up a little bit earlier. Number one is the general US age wave. Um, you know, basically there is a, uh, you know, we're entering a period where there's going to be a, a, a little bit of a decline generally, but there's also another factor that we realized too, and that um, the biggest growth of uh, folks in Des Moines was residents age 40 to 44. Like there was something right around that period of time where there was a spike, a rush of uh, people coming in and it's a, it wasn't quite the same spike in the third of the people who are now in their thirties. So basically, you know, based on what's there, you know, the ones who moved in their thirties and are now 40 to 44 or so the bulk of it, um, there aren't as many in the backfill. I'm gonna guess a lot of it or some of it is driven by the real biggest spike in Des Moines was around 2013 and 2014, which probably all that capital investment pouring in and all that growth probably opened up a lot of new jobs in that period of time where a lot of people in there, you know, at the time 
were like, uh, you know, somewhere between 30 to 34 who are now 40 to, you know, who are now, uh, you know, we're now entering their forties. Um, so there was a big influx at that time, a big spike. Um, and so the question is, can Des Moines continue to turn on that, you know, basically, so in a lot of cities, a lot of investment plans are shelved because of the recession. Um, the question is, can Des Moines maintain that commitment to say, we're going to put on because we know we're going to recover. We know we're going to outgrow the U.S. Let's keep, depl- let's keep investing in our city to create the kind of momentum that brings in more talent, um, that makes it more attractive, that drives that kind of growth. So that's what we're hoping to see because inorganically, we're reverting towards the mean. It's going to look a little bit more normal, um, but Des Moines can be more than normal. I'm going to stick on the population um, line for a little bit here too. So one of the questions that came in from, uh, it was from Pat Pithen. Uh, She says, my kids are 26 and 23. It seems many of their friends are leaving Des Moines for Denver. And so I think we always have kind of this feeling about, is Denver just going to take all our our young folks? So, um, but I'm curious with, with COVID and people having some flexibility perhaps to move different places, um, what type of effects maybe do you think you're going to see from, from the pandemic on, on population trends? Yeah. Okay. First off, I'll take on that, the, that Denver question is she is right. Uh, when, I, when I said like the next Austin, the next uh, Raleigh, Durham, the next Nashville, I should have all Salt, next Salt Lake. I should have also had Denver. Um, those are like the, you know, those are probably like five of the eight of the non-coastal mid-sized cities that have grown significantly. Denver is one of them. Denver is a large, large, uh, large U.S. magnet. Uh, um, And so versus uh, Des Moines has been more of an Iowa magnet. Um, And so, um, you know, she's right. Denver is a net beneficiary of a lot of where the trends are. Um, Now, what we also see is that the influx to Des Moines, um, Here's what we're seeing, and, and this is we discussed a little bit at the last presentation, 2018. Um, Des Moines seems to have a really strong educational system. It does well at getting the kids through the K through 12 system. Um, they have good universities in Iowa, and a lot of students also go to you know go out of state for school, and a lot of them end up um, going to the major metro markets. Um, Des Moines is not a net attractor of adults 22 to 25, 22 to 22 to 29. It is not a net attractor. But around the age of 30, Des Moines really starts to pick up again because Des Moines has a higher rebound factor than what we see in other markets. Um, yeah, I told the story of, um, uh, Back in 2018, I told the story where uh, maybe around 2015, I was sitting around the uh, conference table with uh, one of the large athletic shoe companies, and I was meeting with the executive team of the women's shoe division. And uh, they asked me towards the end of our discussion, tell us more interesting trends about uh, women that you're seeing that are unrelated to our world. And I said, you know, there's actually a very interesting story in something completely unrelated to athletic shoes that... um, you know, there's this city, this Midwestern city, the last one you'd ever think of, that is a magnet for women returning back after basically good education. Um, they put the city behind them. They work in the biggest cities in top jobs, but then they have a higher return ratio than most others. Um, you know, basically, um, you know, and um, then one of the women around the table, uh, dressed all in black, obviously from New York City. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, it's backing up. Um, one woman around the table asked, um, that city is not Des Moines, is it? And I said, how did you know? And she said, well, it's because all of my friends are now calling me saying they're loving moving back to Des Moines or discussing, should we be moving back to Des Moines? Um, and after talking about Des Moines, the woman next to her dressed in all black, obviously from New York City said, man, that's it. that place sounds really great. You know, because basically it's a lot of jobs for professional women who can maintain, basically stay at the top of the game career-wise, you know, live a good life, have a home, have their kids in good schools. Um, and it's usually the, the, the 
women, the, the, the wives who bring the families back, not necessarily the men who bring the families back. Um, and, uh, you know, and after this discussion at Moyne, the EVP who runs the women's division said, man, if we weren't, if we weren't tied to this company, we should be in Des Moines. Um, yeah, and anyway, so the story there is it, it, it doesn't attract in 20s. It is this, it's been this huge magnet of women, of well-educated, high career track women returning in the 30s. So, um, you know, first part of that question. Now, you had a second part of that question? Yeah, the second, just... part, second part would be about the pandemic specifically. Yes. And I'm just curious about with flexibility with where to work and some yes. of the, the norms that have been maybe busted up a little bit, um, how maybe some of those things could affect population and maybe how Des Moines could be well positioned or, or maybe not well positioned. Absolutely. So um, this is something we're spending a lot of our time on. So for example, I had that example of a large master plan community that's uh, you know creating another entire town. Um, they are not a technology epicenter, but they are hugely, hugely targeting um, tech companies, or not just tech companies, but companies in LA and San Francisco uh, for people who are going to be able to leave and uh, basically finally buy a nice home and work in a community of peers like them. Um, so they are totally doing it because what they realized was that, um, you know, we dug into this and what we found was that um, of people working from home in the major metro areas, uh, depending on the city, um, 50 to 75% of them now want remote to be permanent, full-time, or dominant. And of that group, about 40% of them say that they want to move if their employment situation lets them. Now, breaking that down further, the problem is it's not the employee who ultimately gets inside that as much as it's the employer. And employers with strong digital backbones, high office costs, and um, extreme talent shortages are getting very aggressive about making it easy for their employees to move away and still work for the company. Um, so that client is targeting those companies specifically um, because they know that they can now offer homes for those people um, where, you know, where, you know, those, those employees, even they're making tons of money, um, they can't afford the average home in Menlo Park, California, which is $3 million. Um, so uh, there are places that are, gonna, that are going to be taking advantage of this. Um, there is a large population that would like to move, uh, but it is basically, you know, identifying what is that population state that can and what are the drivers to bring them back. So I would put on the table, this is a great time to think about, you know, like Columbus did and like Salt Lake City did to bring a lot of talent back to this, you know, a, a lot of talent who had been through there, um, who had been in that state back to that state. It is a, you know, this is this is a beautiful time to do that. Well, one question I have is uh, around, uh, you, you mentioned when we're investing and in, during the, the previous times where we've had recessions, investing in those early stages. A lot of the things that you mentioned were, were physical investment type of, of things, as opposed to perhaps um, maybe these educational type things. As you're looking right now, after coming out of the pandemic, and you mentioned business growth and those aren't necessarily creating a physical building or creating, but what types of things maybe should we be looking at that would help both uh, that we can learn on, learn based on base from our success the past times, but maybe some tweaks in how we're investing during this time. Okay. Um, one of the things I noticed about Des Moines investment in the community is it's pretty wise investment. We get to see other cities where the investment is not only smaller, but not as wise. So for example, in some other cities that are, that are flailing to try to find, that have been flailing to try to find growth. Investment might be, for example, um, uh, you know, highway projects connecting a office complex outside the city with a um, suburban development far outside the city. So there's basically no real net positive outcome except for you know, that company and the residents in that suburb. And yeah, that's the level of investment versus Investment in Des Moines, we know this seems to be very smart investment, high impact investment, impacting lots of people. So that's one of the things. For some reason, it seems like there is a better filter in Des Moines in deploying capital. Not to mention there is a lot more, there are much higher levels of capital being deployed, which is why it can, you know, why it can drive these waves better. And not to mention, it's 
it's not a gun shy community that sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, gets frightened in recessions. It seems to be very comfortable um, deploying capital early, early, early in the cycles uh, when it can really drive a lot more disproportional juice and have a longer sustained period. So in terms of investment strategy, we don't know the details because we're not like in the weeds and the details like on the client project, but from the surface, what we're seeing, um, I like the investment patterns that we see in Des Moines. Uh, more so than we like and uh, than, than, than we see in a lot of other areas. Uh, I've got a good question here from Sherry Gupta. Um, she says, what factors do you think are holding us back from unleashing our alpha? Do towns dominated perhaps by insurance industries tend to have calculated cautious mindsets that inhibit uh, investment in risky innovation? Is that maybe our risk averse culture uh, perhaps in Iowa? Um, and then she also brings up a second point. So this is the second part of the question, which is, does our lack of diversity perhaps inhibit our ability to, to do some of this in innovation and business creation? Uh, quick answer, I'd say yes and yes. And let me clarify a little bit on that. Um, the, in terms of towns dominated by insurance industry, um, Hartford is a basket case. Um, it's, one of the, it's one of the slower growth mid-sized cities. And I don't know it's a basket case, but the state is extremely financially challenged and Hartford and most of the state, yeah, except for some Connecticut suburbs where a lot of New Yorkers are fleeing because of COVID, which we couldn't have anticipated, um, is, all, is basically zero growth. Um, it just cannot get anything, any, any significant thing really rolling there. Um, and it could because it has a lot of wonderful characteristics to it. Um, it just has not put together a plan as well as Des Moines has, for example. Um, now, but that doesn't mean that just because you're an insurance driven, you know, region that you can't do something. We raised the example of Columbus, which of course is a little bit larger, a little bit more diversified. Um, but Columbus has almost the exact same level of companies employment insurance field. Um, they're turning it on right now. Uh, they're doing really good. So it doesn't mean you are trapped because of the insurance industry, but you know, the risk averse culture, I suspect it is a little bit there. Um, you know, the, you know, it's pretty clear. Des Moines has great jobs, great companies. It makes it a little bit harder to say, yeah, I'm going to take that risk. Um, that's, a per that, that's not a bad thing. Um, it would just good to see a little bit more diversification around that. Um, and uh, basically, there are also ways that you can de-risk ventures as well, too. You know, for example, that's why, for example, these second tier markets have focused a lot on making sure that people know that talent is redeployable. Um, that's part of how you, de that's how you de-risk going into ventures to say, look, there's enough of a cluster here where if you are, um, if your company doesn't make it or you lose your job, there are other companies where you can redeploy. Um, it's why, like, one of the things I'm thinking about is a twist on that Covail uh, uh, corporate collaborative. Yeah, I'm thinking, like, there are ways to restructure um, entrepreneurial formation development. Like if I were a heavy investor in Des Moines, I think I know what I would do is, you know, maybe that's probably another discussion, but I would find ways to cluster people to be able to redeploy the teams fast. So in other words, like Techstars now coming in has a very good model at accelerating fast, whether finding out fast, whether you're going to make it or not, you know, the fast fail concept. And part of the benefit of that is if it's going to fail, fail faster. So you can find ways to redeploy talent faster and redistribute talent, redeploy talent. And there are, uh, there are lots of ways turning through my mind as to how to do that, uh, where basically you can get that. Now, there's one more question about that, about lack of diversity. Um, I do think that's a problem. Um, a large portion of, uh, wait, the well, it's more than 50% of the founders um, in Silicon Valley um, you know, were not born in the U.S., um, a uh, large portion of the workforce. Um, so I think there are, you know, there are definitely challenges there is that Des Moines is a huge magnet for um, a workforce that, um, uh, Des Moines is a huge magnet for a population that does not match uh, where a lot of the employment flow is um, for, you know, for let's say the tech industry. And then there's the other question about not just like tech ventures, but um, I'm really concerned about this issue of half the rate of new business formation because it's not just about tech ventures. Um, you know, with every 17 to 27 new residents, you know, there should be more um, 
pizza shops, dry cleaners, you know, uh, um, you know, um, you know, uh, lawn maintenance services, um, pet shops, you know, all sorts of local businesses that start to grow. But for some reason, that does not happen at the same rate, which could untap a lot of new jobs for a much wider audience. But for some reason, it's like if you're plugged into one of the big companies, it seems like everything's fine. If you're not in that ecosystem, for some reason, it seems harder for new businesses to get off the ground where there's opportunity for more new business formation, more new job creation, more new wealth creation that just doesn't happen at the same for more people. Um, that just uh, that serving the local population, it just isn't happening elsewhere. So that's why we put that issue on the table. Question from Angie Arthur, and, and she asked specifically, did you, did you review uh, Des Moines from a racial equity component? Anything in your data specifically that looked at that? Um, she says, well, the numbers look positive from an overall perspective. Local reports, one that uh, has uh, that we've been leaning on pretty heavy here is one economy, show that our community members of color are not seeing the same level of success. And wonders if you could speak to that gap. Uh, very, very um, correct. And uh, maybe, I don't know if I'll be, uh, if I'll have time to really ma manage this uh, live, but I can actually, um, I can actually pull up numbers out of that, out of Stratum Analytics here. Let's uh, fire up the engine. Um, let's see if I can get this up in time. I might not be able to do while I talk, but that is a very, very true um, issue and concern. And if I can't do that now, we can follow up. Uh, I can follow up separately um, on that. But uh, you know, the quick story is it is a phenomenal magnet, uh, phenomenal success for the dominant population in Des Moines that is not being seen across the board. And so that's. Uh, I'll see if I can pull up some numbers on this on the fly. It is one of the reasons why. So um, you know. It is one of the reasons why I am concerned about this uh, net business formation issue. Um, the reason why I'm concerned about the net business formation issue is that, um, let's see, race and ethnicity. Uh, and let's do uh, income. Uh, we'll go ahead and see if we can pull some of the numbers on this. The reason why I'm concerned about that is uh, new business formation, for example, is just one of the examples of... Um, you know, where there can be new jobs created, um, you know, outside the system of the giant companies, um, where there can be new jobs created, new wealth created, and so forth. And so, you know, I'd be, I'd, I'd be taking a look at that issue. I would be concerned, like, basically our, so let's see. So, for example, heat map population, um, it over-indexes location quotient, a much higher white population, much lower on black, you know, uh, American Indian, Asian, um, Hispanic, um, you know, basically half the, you know, not even <laughs> actually uh, only about a quarter of the rate, you know, a third of the rate and a quarter of the rate by various ethnicities um, as found in the U.S., you know, versus one and a half times the rate of the white population. Um, although we see this bubble happening here, I guess there must be, uh, you know, uh, two race households that are moving in because it's starting to change with children. Um, now we can take a look at sort of, uh, you know, uh, indicators by, you know, maybe this is going to be too much to do, um, to do, to do this, uh, to pull this together on phone, uh, you know, while we're on the call, but, um, it is why I'm concerned about like outside the big system, hopefully the big companies addressing this issue. I hope that there are a lot of small employment growth opportunities as well too. And I think we may have tagged where the issue is new business formation. There's not, it's dominated by big companies. There's not as much activity among the smaller businesses. So um, that is an area where I would be drilling down. Another question here. This is from Emily Shetler. Um, she says, similar to Angie's question, what role do you think social justice issues play in people's decisions to move uh, to or away from certain cities? Can racial injustice or even perceived racial injustice lead to people choosing uh, to move to a city or move away from a city? Yeah, it's a good question. We try to take a look at this stuff as quantitative as possible. Um, and we have not seen good quantitative measures on that question yet. So I'm not sure that I can answer that definitively. Um, but I think what is fair to say is that um, we have seen 
that cities that are more exclusive than inclusive, um, or I'll maybe tighten this tighter, of Midwestern cities that are more exclusive than inclusive, I think it's pretty safe to say do have lower economic performance and in part because their labor markets are smaller, um, wealth concentration is even more distributed, um, and it shows up in GDP numbers. So we have been running sort of uh, um, assessments of that where we can feel comfortable with that statement versus cities and regions that are more inclusive um, in terms of, um, you know, basically... uh, uh, greater ability for wealth creation across a broader audience, um, greater um, rate of new business formation across uh, races and classes, um, or and 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 across races and income, um, are the cities that are seeing higher growth. Now, of course, what we have not been able to do yet, uh, because we haven't found good enough data yet, is to separate uh, causation and correlation on that so we don't have a definitive answer. But we certainly do see a relationship in that in some looking at. We haven't done a specific analysis on that, but as a byproduct of some other work we've done, we can feel comfortable with that first part of that statement that, uh, you know, yes, there are observable differences in economic outcomes. Well, uh, James, we're getting close to the end here. And so I want to have two final questions for you. One uh, would be if, if we're looking at some of the comp cities or some of the cities that maybe we should be looking to, are there some examples of some cities and, and maybe a, a project or two or things that could help us with that alpha component that you were talking about? And then I want to give you a chance to give kind of a, a wrapping closing thought on any advice that you have for, for Des Moines. Okay. So the question about comp cities, um, that is in part why we did raise Columbus and Salt Lake City. Um, Salt Lake City has seen, the Salt Lake City region has seen phenomenal growth in the last decade as well too. They have been a phenomenal magnet of that 25 to 20, 39 year old rebound audience. Um, They have been phenomenal, phenomenal new business formation and uh, phenomenal outcomes. Uh, Now, once again, um, uh, so I would put that on the table. Columbus has been really turning it on in the last five years. Um, now, of course, there's a little bit of a challenge. Um, Columbus and the um, Salt Lake City region are about twice the size of Des Moines. They're, They're not exactly perfect comps because of the size difference. Um, but I got to be honest with you. I don't see a city Des Moines size where there's a true comp. All the comps we look at by population, Des Moines, Des Moines crushes it. Um, it is without peers at that level. It has to look a level up for comps that it can that uh, um, that are that can provide guidance on on like you know picking up the pace and that's why I put those two on the table uh, so Gunnar mentioned that the uh, your presentation and the video of today will be online on the tomorrow plan speaker uh, series website uh, you can find that link in the chat uh, James thank you for taking so many questions today why don't you give us a, a final thought and then I'm going to turn it over to Jay to, to wrap us up today Final thought. Um, first off, it has been a pleasure to be able to dip my toe into Des Moines after just having seen it only peripherally as a byproduct of comp analysis in other cities. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to understand why Des Moines is so different than the other comp cities. Um, I totally get it now, why it had that outperformance in 2010. And I see wonderful opportunities ahead, but um, if it gets, if Des Moines gets complacent and just sort of assumes that the growth they saw in the 2020s is going to, the 2010s is going to automatically happen in the 2020s, it's not. Um, Some of those forces change. However, um, if Des Moines continues to keep believing in itself and investing in itself, um, the returns are fantastic for the city. Um, you know, return on invested capital, which is, you know, a huge quantitative measure we use, whether for private sector or public sector, um, is phenomenal in Des Moines. And if the investment keeps up, the return will be phenomenal. Um, now, of course, that's the easy with the half of the equation is riding the beta driven recovery. The tougher part is the alpha equation because alpha is effectively flat. 
And that's really, really hard to do for mid-sized cities. It's really, really hard to do for non-coastal cities because the economy is turned so tech and finance driven, um, which are such coastal industries. That alpha is not going to come organically. That alpha is going to come with continually tuning and tweaking the foundational pieces that are in place um, and continuing to try to raise the bar constantly to hit the formula where it can really start to take off in Des Moines. That's really hard, but if there is one city that can pull it off in this cluster of cities where it's virtually impossible, my bet is on Des Moines. Thanks, James. Jay, why don't you take, go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks, Chris. And James, great to see you again. It's, it's always great working with you and your team, and we really appreciate uh, your insights and your, um, advice for us uh, moving forward. Um, also, I uh, want to, again, thank um, all the partners who helped pull this event together through this Memorial Plan series, our, our great friends at the MPO. Um, Todd and his crew do a great job, and the Community Foundation. Christy, thank you for, for your leadership and, and Capital Crossroads um, and all of our other partners who helped pull this together. And, um, you know, I like to talk about uh, Greater Des Moines' secret sauce of, of, of all these sort of things that, um, in terms of sort of the, a lot of these strengths that James has, has, has identified in addition to, um, you know, the opportunities moving forward. But, you know, again, um, as, I've, as I've said many, many times, you know, I think that this region does a great job of public-private partnerships, of, of regionalism and coming together to act bigger than we are um, as individual cities. Um, a lot of strong leaders in the public sector and the private and nonprofit profit sector. And, and this community has also, I think, done a, a great job for, for many years of every five or so years putting together a very aggressive uh, regional vision plan and then implementing that. And, um, I, you know, with, with COVID-19 has really given us a, an opportunity, I think, as it's in some ways it's been sort of this great reset for all of us, right? Um, we're always sort of moving so, so fast and, and moving forward. And, and don't always have the opportunity to really uh, take a look around at our, in, in terms of what we can do better, right? So, um, you know, there's all this talk about the next normal or the new normal, and we like to talk with Capital Crossroads, the Greater Moon Partnership, and all of our partners about how do we create that better normal. And I think James has done a really great job of identifying how, um, as a region, we can create that better normal, both on the, the beta and the alpha side, um, and, and things that we can do moving forward. And, and the timing is actually really, really good. Um, because um, Capital Crossroads, which is our 2.0, which is our current five-year vision plan, um, we are teed up in 2021 as a region to come together and put together a new regional vision plan. We don't know what it's going to be named. Uh, we don't know exactly um, the process, um, but, but I do know that um, with, you know, almost 200 people on this call with lots of great ideas, we're going we're gonna, to, and, and I, again, a lot of the ideas I think that James provided with us today and others, um, an opportunity for us to help create that better normal and come together and, and put together that plan, that next five-year plan. That, that group of leaders now is us, um, and it's incumbent upon us um, to put together that plan and to be very aggressive and, and move forward. And, and we know that we've done it in the past and we can do it moving forward. But, you know, what can we do to create that better normal? Um, you know, James identified, you know, in terms of things that we can do better with um, entrepreneurship and innovation, but also inclusion, um, sustainability, resilience, all these things that right now um, that, we know we can get better, um, and now's the time, and, 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 and we're the group to do it. So, uh, James, thank you again so much for your leadership, and um, um, I, I, I'm going to uh, sort of wrap up again with something you said today, but, but kind of what sparked um, us pulling all this together was um, I'd post something on LinkedIn this summer about one of the projects. I, it might have been the, the skate park or something like that where we're going to have the largest skate park in the, in the country that's moving forward, but James posted – um, in response, um, one of the, and he said this today, one of the reasons we found that Des Moines was one of the strongest performing mid-sized U.S. cities in the past decade was that it continued to move forward and invest in itself during the last recession. And it looks like the pattern continues. So I think more than anything, whether we're working on beta, whether we're working on alpha, um, that COVID-19, we can't let that um, keep us from moving forward. Um, we know that we need to be safe, so we're collaborative, but we need to continue to advance our economy. We need to continue to move our, our big projects forward, and we need to continue to get better at things like entrepreneurship and figuring out how we're going to attract and retain that next generation of talent and, and continue to um, create and be champions of disruption and that on the future world of work and, and, uh, and all these other things that we need to move forward on. So again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today and look forward to the next steps. And uh, 
um, and I uh, look forward to ongoing discussions as we continue to make Greater Des Moines even greater. So thanks everybody for being with us.